All right, all right. Hey. That's <laughs> a walk-up song. I like that. That is awesome. Hey, go ahead and grab your Bible to uh, and turn to uh, Acts chapter 9 is where we're going to be. Of course, you can see there, brand new. It's all brand new. We're going to talk about what it is to, to get a brand new start. Today, we're going to talk about what it is to get a brand new identity. Now, while you're turning there, book of Acts, we're looking at the person of Saul, Paul. I use his name interchangeably. Uh, he had a Hebrew name and he had a Greek name. That was actually kind of common back in his day. And uh, his name was not changed because of his, um, his conversion, like Peter. A lot of people think that it was. It was actually to more identify with those that he was called to reach. It's an interesting and, and powerful lesson as well. Uh, but hey, while you're turning there, um, I read about uh, this guy. He was, uh, it's kind of, kind of a gruesome story, but this guy was found unconscious behind a a Burger King. This was August 31st, 2004. Um, no identification on him. Uh, nobody knew who he was. They took him to the hospital. He regains consciousness over time and he's suffering amnesia. Doesn't know who he is. True story. Doesn't know where he's from. Doesn't know his name. They do some, ultimately, some genetic testing, trying to figure out. They put posts out in the news and all this kind of, which is part of the sad part of the story. Nobody came forward and said, well, that's my dad, that's my brother, nobody, for 11 years. In fact, early on in it, he said, I think he thought his name was Benjamin, so he took on his name Benjamin Kyle, his new, new name, new identity, didn't know who he was. And then, uh, after some further testing and such, some genetic uh, testing, they discovered that his actual name was William Powell. And even then, he, there's 20 years of his life that's unaccounted for. He doesn't remember most of his life, and he hardly remembers much of any of his life. So he takes on now his new identity, which is actually his old identity, who he was formerly. And, I mean, how crazy is that? And you might think, well, that's a, that's a crazy, radical story that may happen to some, I don't know, I've heard of amnesia before. Um, people like Jason Bourne, I mean, he went through a little bit of that. <laughs> Um, most underrated trilogy of all time. Am I right? Okay, come on. Man, some of y'all get more excited about that than worship earlier. But um, So, yeah, Jason Bourne, he didn't know who he was, and he had to figure all that out. Can you imagine going through like that? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember my name. I don't know who I am. I got no family. And yet, the Bible tells us, and then we often experience that. We know this. Many of us live that way. The Bible says, like William Powell, most of no, all of us initially have forgotten who we really are. And we've got to recapture this identity that God has given to us. Jesus breaks through all that. He gives us a brand new identity. But first, we've got a process to go through as, he, as we allow him to change our lives. And so we're going to look at Saul and how he walked through this entire process of his life an identity, mistaken identity, and then he gets this new identity, and, and this is such a powerful word for all of us here. If you know me well enough, you know that the truth found in, in this concept, this idea, this truth, scriptural truth has changed my life, and I, I am so passionate about this that I want it to change your life. It's at the core of what it means to be a believer is that you now have a new identity in Christ. And I mean, let's, let's just admit it. All of us walk through um, identity crises. I mean, a lot of us, if we're not old enough, as a child, you generally go through middle school in a perpetual identity crisis and on into high school, for real. Like, I remember when I was, we've all done this. We go through phases, right? You can, we, could, we could get up and share stories. It'd be hilarious. I went through a phase. I mean, some of y'all are, you know, like me. I mean, I was, uh, I mean, I was an athlete, you know, or I think early on, frankly, I look back and interpret my story. I was, I was the good kid, you know, I, Jeff's a good kid. I'm a good kid. Okay, I'll be that kid, right? Maybe you're the smart kid. Maybe you're the, you're the one who, you went through that Western phase. I'm a cowboy. Oh, well, yeah, but not really. You know, you live in Dallas. You know? um, or you, you're the golf phase, right? Or the, or the rebellious phase. We've all been through phases. Some of you don't know, in college, so I played a little soccer, and so I was the soccer player, you know, identities that are based on things that we do. I went through a season in, in college I went to school not too far from the East Coast, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. We'd make. The, I was I was a surfer dude in college. Yeah, like back when I had hair. I was <laughs> not really, but um, 
But I was, I was surfer dude, so you could think and we could all laugh together. But here's the deal. If you continue that, and here's what I see in a lot of adults, we grow out of those, that childhood or, or teenage years, and we continue to live out a false identity. And, and many of us have a mistaken identity even today, and just like the Bible tells us, like William Powell, we've got a mistaken identity that we're constantly fighting against. So how do you navigate an identity crisis? I want us to talk about that. We're going to look at at Saul in, in chapter 9. We look at this last week if you're with us. So I'm going to buzz through a, a pretty larger portion of passage uh, of Scripture uh, in order to, to save some time, but really to make the points along the way. Um, you know, the Acts of the Apostles, it's called. It's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Acts of His Spirit moving through apostles, through people. That's how He moves. That's how God changes the world. That's how his spirit moves. Talk about presence. How his spirit moves is through one person at a time. And one person takes center stage and his name is Saul, initially Paul. He is the man. Last week we looked at how we get a new start. It requires humility and submission. It requires obedience. It requires this uh, uh, you know, clarity regarding who Jesus really is. And, and so the first thing I want you to see, if you take notes, I've got four things I want us to look at. First is acknowledge you got to acknowledge your mistaken identity. That's kind of how I'm trying to set this up for you. Saul was a religious superstar. Some of you know this. His pedigree is in Philippians 3, where he talks about, I mean, there's nobody like him. You know, he was like, um, you can't touch this. You know, uh, in terms of religious commitment, nobody could, I mean, he, you know, like, who's your daddy? You know, Saul is, okay? I am, I'm better than any of you. I am more, more committed. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Some of you know that. He rattles it off, and he's using all of his gifting, his brilliance, his zeal, his passion, thinking that he's serving Yahweh. I mean, he really, he's the primary religious persecutor, as we noted last year. He's an anti-Christian terrorist, pulling people out, even there, it's why he's in this area now, taking people bound back to Jerusalem because he wants to end this new movement, this Jesus movement. So think about it. And here's the challenge for some of us here today. If you've never given your heart to Christ, or if you're really wrestling in your spiritual life right now, here's a question. I just want to frame this. What does it feel like, like, like Saul? Think about it. He went from thinking he's 100% right to he is dead wrong. And yet he was convinced. What does it feel like to be wrong you ever been wrong in your life? We all have been. What does it feel like? You can say, well, it's kind of embarrassing or it's convicting. Um, hopefully it's life changing. It's, it's, you know what it feels like to be wrong most of the time? Exactly what it feels like to be right. Because you think you're right and you're wrong. This is why coming before the Lord and even today as you hear this word, from his word, that we've got to open our hearts and say, Lord, speak your truth into my heart. It's why we, we cry out to him in worship. It's why we remind, we're reminded of, of what he's done for us, how good he is, what he's done for us in Christ, that death was arrested. We come before him in worship and say, Lord, keep reminding me. Remind me of what you've done for me and who I am. But I want you to see what happens here. Uh, we, we, we looked at this last week. Look at Philippians, I mean Philippians, look at Acts 9. Verse uh, 4 is where we start to see this encounter that he has, okay, with, with Jesus. And this is, again, we looked at this last week, so I'll buzz through this. Um, he said, so who are you? He says, why are you, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And so you may know the story. He's blinded by this light. This is a real event. This is not a vision. He has a real event, objective reality that others are seeing, other people are with him. They guide him to Damascus. And there was a, a disciple, a follower of Jesus, verse 10, Ananias, who we introduced uh, you to last week. Ananias, the Lord, comes to him, now in a vision. And he says, yeah, here I am, Lord. He speaks to him. He says, I want you to go. He gives him real specific instruction to go find this man. I want you to lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. He's been blinded. He hasn't eaten anything for three days. Ananias says, whoa, 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 I've heard about this guy. I, uh-uh, no. And then so, I mean, this is why the Lord gives him a vision. He says, no, I want you to do this. Now look at verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name, the name of Jesus we've sung about, before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must, uh-oh, suffer for my name. For my name's sake, for the sake of my name. So the Lord 
radically comes into or, or reveals himself to Saul. Now, those three days, I'm sure he's going, what just happened to me? He's in a state of shock is what's going on. He can't quite figure out what's up. And then God sends Ananias to confirm what's happening in his heart and in his life. But the problem that Saul's going to have to wrestle with, and here's where this goes, he's going to have to come to grips with the fact he's been wrong all of his life. That his worth is not determined by how good he is, even how religious he is, not by his knowledge of Scripture. This guy's brilliant, not by his performance. He, his, his worth now is crumbling right before him over these days that will follow. And, and so I want you to see what happens here. He has this mistaken identity, and, and he, he's, he's living in prison is how he would define this later. That, that, that God would set him free from prison. I don't know if you have read... Um, so Brian Stevenson wrote this book called Just Mercy, um, uh, an incredible book about uh, an attorney. He, he graduated from Harvard Law School. There's a movie out about it right now, which I got to go see because it looks legit. And, and I think Jamie Foxx is in it. And, and it's about Brian Stevenson who, who uh, graduates from Harvard Law and then he ends up in the South primarily uh, helping men who are, and women who are on death row. He so far has released... 135 people who were on death row, most of them there because of mistaken identity. Somebody thought they were someone else or they said, that's the guy who killed my mom or whatever. That's the guy who did. I've seen some pictures and they look a lot like people that, you know, they look like others and it's not the same person. You've heard stories like this. But, but what, what many of us are doing, we're living out this mistaken identity that either we have put on ourselves, we've come to believe, or we've allowed others to put it on us. You know, growing up, a lot of us, we hear messages indirectly or, or subconsciously or somehow that, that, that we ha we're this person. And some of us, we start to learn like a tape recorder, something played over and over again, nonstop, just repeated. I am this person. I'm a loser. I'm a failure. I, and we have this thing that's constantly playing in our minds. And I'm challenging you today to, to, to combat that with the truth of God's word and what it says about you. You're going to hear what God says about you that needs to combat all the lies that are driving you. Many of us are living in a prison because of a mistaken identity that we've put on ourselves or we've allowed others to put on us, just like, just like Saul. So the Lord chooses him, and he is, his life is about to get wrecked. Because what happens when you encounter the, the real Jesus, he's going to mess with your life. And so he has this, this, this identity crisis that he's going to go through now. He's, he's going to have to suffer for the Lord. There's a breaking point, and, and, and he's going to have to deal with this new identity that God is giving, in, giving him. He's encountering Christ, and he, it creates a new crisis. Watch this. When you encounter Christ, really, uh, the real Jesus is going to create a new crisis. But the new crisis is a crisis of faith. Will you trust him with what he truly says about you? This is really the Christian life, to remain in him, what he says about you, not what you constantly are, are prone to believe, the lies that you're going to believe, others who will place this mistaken identity, a false identity on you. Most of it's in our own minds. We do it ourselves, don't we? Because we base our worth and our value on our performance or on the approval of others. And, and Saul is entrenched in this mistaken identity, like many of us here today. We've come to believe this thing about us. Everyone had labeled him, even Ananias. Like, no, he's that guy. We know who he is. He's going to have to go through this. So the second thing I want you to see, you're going to have to endure the identity crisis. And, and, and here's what I mean. He's going to go through a period of time, like all of us. Rarely does it just happen immediately. Salvation can be a radical shift in our identity if we understand it. But to live it out takes time, and it's going to take some time for Paul. A crisis of identity is actually a... A psychological term. You probably know that. Here's how it's defined. A period of uncertainty. Think about your own life. And confusion in which a person's sense of identity becomes insecure, typically due to a change in their expected aims or role in society. How many of you have been through an identity crisis? Because here's the truth. You think that sounds real clinical. That sounds, you know, psychological or something. Every one of us are one afternoon away from a major identity crisis. Every one of us. I know I've walked through what you could call many times an identity crisis. I thought I was that guy. I thought I was doing this. I thought this was true about me. 
And then that thing is taken away. We grow up. We laugh about being kids and not trying to figure what we do then as adults. We land on a particular identity that's external, outside of ourselves, outside of Christ even. And we say, I am this person. I'm a business person. That's who I am. I'm an athlete or, you know, I'm a mom placing my identity in my children. I am this or that. I'm this or that until it's taken away. Then we're set before, set before us a crisis, and we don't know who we are. How do we endure the identity crisis? Well, look at what's interesting is God sends Ananias, and in verse 17, he lays his hands on him, and he calls Saul brother. We, we referenced this last week. How powerful is that? Now, most of us, when we go through identity crisis, we want to cocoon, you know, in order to take time to become the butterfly that God's created us to be. But Saul didn't do that. He dives straight in. And then it says, verse 19, this is worth noting. Verse 19, it says, for some days then, okay, after he, he, he gets his sight back, some days he's with the disciples. That some days, by the way, we know from other passages of Scripture, Galatians 1, some other places, that some days is three years. And that, make, make a note there. Write that in your Bible because that's important to note. Saul, but it does say immediately while he's in Damascus, he is preaching the word. He's going into synagogue. He's saying, let me tell you about Jesus, because I think I've figured this out. I thought there was a coming Messiah. I know all about the Old Testament. I've memorized the Torah. I know all the prophecies. I have come to discover that Jesus is the one we've been looking for. He's already come, and I have now figured out who the Messiah is. And so he's preaching that. He's teaching that. He's confounding all of them. It says he's confounding the, the Hellenistic Jews. Those are the Greek-speaking um, Jews, we're going to see later on. But verse 19, he's with the disciples, not the apostles yet. He will. He's with disciples for three years. Now, I love this. I'm guessing they're, they're like, man, bro, let, let's tell you what's up. Okay, here's what's true about Jesus. And then he starts to understand and he jumps right in. I guess the key um, idea there is sometimes we don't just think our way into a new way of acting. But sometimes we get to act our way into a new way of thinking. I mean, sometimes we just need patterns in our lives that will bring about change as we think about resolutions and all that good stuff. But look at, look at chapter 9, verse 22. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. I love that. He, he just pressed on into it. But let's stop for a moment. This is the most important moment, perhaps, in the message. What is it that Saul discovered? What is this radical identity? What is this new identity that God gives us when we come to know him? What is the major shift? And I want to explain it this way uh, as the truest thing about you. Dave Lomas wrote a book entitled The Truest Thing About You. He's a pastor out in um, Reality Church in San Francisco. And it's a great book, by the way, that I've had our whole staff read. You ought to read it. A couple of years ago, we all read it together. Uh, the truest thing. And the premise is this. There's a lot of things that are true about you are true about me. Right? So I could say I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a friend, I'm a pastor. I mean, I could keep going. But none of those things are the truest thing about me. And often we attach our identities to these things that are not the truest thing, core to our identity and who we really are. And so any one of those things could be taken away from me this afternoon. Any one of those things could be taken away. And so the truest thing about us, the truest thing about me, and if you have received Christ, this is why this is so powerful. The truest storyline in my life is that I am a beloved son of God. That's who I am. That never changes. It's the one thing that doesn't change. I'm defined by his great love for me and not all of these other things. So this is a freeing way to live. So what did he come to understand? Let's look at his own words, all right? I am totally accepted by God. That's, that's the first thing he comes to understand. Romans 5.1, therefore, in fact, let's read this together. You can see it on the screen. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ justified. If you know that Paul then wrote 13 books of the New Testament, he wrote Romans, where he talks so much about what it is to be justified. He thought, and he realized, Abraham was justified by faith. It's always been by faith, not by works. Everybody's got it wrong. 
And he comes to understand this, and it blows his mind. We said it this way, uh, justify. You've heard it described, just as if I'd never sinned. And that's true. It's powerful. But for a lot of us, maybe you're like me, um, who grew up in the church, it's just as if I'd always obeyed. Because my, my worth and my identity is not found in my past. It's found in Jesus' past. And his past is perfect. And so my identity in him now, forgiven by him, I am now justified. I am fully pleasing to God. Let's read this together. Let's proclaim this true about us. Some of us need to do this. Romans 5.10. For if, we, if while we were enemies, say this with me, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Yes. Look at this next truth. I am completely loved by him. Let's read this together, Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. His love is pure. It's not based on how good I am. And then look at this, this, this next point. We could go on and on, but I'll, I'll end this portion with this. I am fully alive in him. I was dead. Now I'm alive. Let's read this together, Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. But God... Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. I love that. I was dead. This is not, again, it's not sickness to health. This is death to life. And we were, this is not a metaphor for Paul. We were dead. Of all the storylines of your life, friends, if you know Christ, if you've received his grace, You are a beloved son or daughter of the king. And that's who you are. And everything else in life comes out of that. So here's what all this means. Your worth is not found in your your work. It's not found in in how good you are, in your performance, or the approval of us. It's not even found in your desires. More and more we see this. People who say, "My, my worth and my identity is found in my desires. You think about even sexual desires. Someone could have a particular sexual desire... And it drives everything, where they live, where they shop, where they go to, you know, who they hang out with, who their friends are, who they don't hang out with, because of their desire. We, we base our identity on things that can change in a moment. And so in our day, you know, we've talked about this a lot, that we, you, you determine who you are. You, whatever identity you want to take on, you do that. No, no outside authority, just your, your own autonomous self, anything outside of that is wrong and hurtful. So just go after it. You be you. You do you, right? You identify as you will. And all of this driven by our, we, I mean, we don't take into account, we miss something. Uh, sin is what it's called in scripture. That we want to go our own way. And, and we turned away from God. All of us are prone to place our identities in all of these things. C.S. Lewis said this in The Four Loves. He says, do not let your happiness depend on something you may lose. Right? I would say, don't base your identity, your worth on something that be taken away. How crazy is that? That's just logical, is it not? And yet, how do you do it? Name it today before we're done in this time. The only logical way to live is to place your ultimate worth in something that does not change. It, what, it's what Paul would say in the epistles. You, you've got to live in him, covered in his grace, covered by his forgiveness, completely loved by him. I'm a beloved son of the Most High King. I love what Henry Nouwen wrote in Spiritual Direction. He says this, From the moment we claim the truth of being the beloved, we are faced with the call to become who we are. Now what's he saying? Here's what's wild. You do you, okay, is what drives our culture. I would say once you're in Christ and you now know who you are in him, you do you. Do the new you. And yes, with all the gifts, passion, personalities that God's given you, once we discover that who we are as the beloved of God, then we're faced with living life as he called us to live. I mean, it's, it's kind of this way. Think about this. Becoming sanctification, we call it. Becoming more and more like Jesus. Is, is really not becoming something I'm not. It is that. Habits and, 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 and sinful you know, desires and things that have transforming me. But it's really becoming who I already am in Him. 
who he's already claimed me to be. He reckoned me as righteous. He has given me a new identity in him. Now I'm simply becoming who he has already created me to be. It's Michelangelo looking at the slab of marble and chipping everything away that's not David. It's it's him chipping away all that is not Christ so that I would become like him. This is the Christian life. But it begins when I understand. No, when I receive his grace, his love, and I'm defined by it then. And I live every day. Lord, remind me again how much you love me. It's why every morning, every prayer, every time I enter to worship, Lord, remind me again of how much you love me. Because I'm prone to forget. I'm prone to move away from that. See, sanctification is the stripping away of all that is not Jesus in my life. And that sounds real real awesome and amazing from, from the platform. That is brutal. And, and, and Ananias says to Paul, Let me, hey, uh, Jesus says, go tell him how much he's going to suffer for me. For his own good and for my glory. Because the stripping away of all that is not Jesus in our lives is him taking away one idol after another, one false identity after another. But as a believer, you've got to endure the identity crisis. You've got to press through it like Paul did. And thirdly, look at this, watch out for identity theft. Because here's what happens in those uh, passages to follow. Uh, We see him, he, he doesn't have a tribe. I mean, it's like He goes to preach and everybody's against him. We see in verse 23 there for many days, he's with the Jews. They plotted to kill him. Okay, so then he's got disciples now in verse 24. They take him out by night, lower him down out of an opening in the wall uh, of the city and lower him in a basket. That's kind of cool. And then he, he takes off and then he goes to Jerusalem. He attempts to join the disciples and they're afraid of him. This is three years later. I mean, think about the real stories. Like, bro, you took my, my mom, or you, you, you ended up, you're the one that killed my brother. I mean, they remember this guy. And, and, you know, we don't have the internet. They didn't know what was up. They didn't know, but he's back. And they're scared to death. And finally, Barnabas, we're introduced to him, brings him to the apostles and says, This guy's been preaching Jesus. Talk to him. Let's get to know him. Don't be afraid of him. He's for real. And so he, he continues on, but the point is this. Watch out for those who, well-intentioned people who will want to steal your identity, take it away. Or, or you'll come up against those who would fight against you. Some of you are new believers, and you know what I'm talking about. Man, your family is like, what is up? You have this different relationship with them. The more and more you live out your, your, your Christian life in the workplace, it's like, hey, bro, whoa. You know, and you, and you, it, it, it impacts and changes. We've got to press through that. We've got to refuse and not go back to our old identity. We've got to stand firm. And so we see it there in Acts 9, 28 through 30. He's preaching boldly. He, he spoke against and disputed against the Hellenist and, and those who were trying to kill him. And the brothers, they learned of this and they brought him out. Again, he has to run for his life. This guy is in trouble. But let me ask you this. Um, where are you prone to place your identity apart from Christ? And, and, and like Like Saul, do people know where you find your core identity? I mean, ultimately, do people at work know you're a follower of Jesus? People at school know that that's where you place your identity. Your worth is in him and not in all the other stuff. I mean, we have positions and places where we can, platforms where we can show people what it is to live our lives in an identity in Christ and not in other things that everybody else is pursuing. And and so the last thing I want to say is this before we close. Embrace your new identity. Embrace it and live in it. We see in verse 31, look at this. It says in verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea and and, and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. I love that. Can you see how your identity in Christ is the most valuable thing that you have in your life? Saul felt it was worth dying for. And I believe that it is. But look at what happens when believers come together and say, Jesus is the one where we find our identity and our worth. Not our performance, not the approval of others, not even in our desires. We lay those before him. And and, and what happens is the church experiences peace. So there's this unity in the body. And then they're building one another up is what we do here. Building each other up walking in reverence before the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit. Unity plus building up plus walking in reverence. 
in the spirit equals multiplication. The spirit does the work and, and he's the one that moves. So I want to challenge you with this as we close. We're going to pray together and we're going to sing our way out uh, as we uh, just worship the Lord one final time together, proclaiming how good he is to us. And so what I want you to do right now, let's just bow our heads and close our eyes as we wrap up our time. I guess the key question I've asked it for you to come to grips with before you rush off into the day, into the week, maybe the most holy moment of your week right now. Where are you prone to place your identity? And for a lot of us, it's probably a really good thing. A good thing to become a God thing in your life. Friend, today, listen, you're, you're not defined by your profession. Be taken away from you tomorrow. You're not defined by the fact you're, a, you're married to a certain person or your mother or father. You're not defined by where you live. It's not defined, you're not defined by what you have. Where are you prone to run? Give that to him. Release it. And then praise him for how he has set you free. Continue to fight the fight. Recognize, acknowledge your mistaken identity. Endure the identity crisis. Watch out for identity theft. Stay in the word. Stay in the truth. Stay in his church. Be with other believers who can remind you all the time. And do that with people in your life. And let us commit ourselves to him. Be defined by the goodness of God. By his grace to us in Jesus. He took our sin upon the cross so that we might be set free. And we can live in freedom and live boldly for him and praise him and worship him with our lives. So let's do that even now. Lord, we love you. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen.